All right. Have you ever believed something about yourself or someone else that you later found out wasn't true? Yeah? I definitely have. Um, when I was in middle school, I believed that I could play any sport, right? <clears throat> Some of you might have made this fatal mistake before. And see, the thing is, is it wasn't completely my fault. Because I grew up in this house where my dad, like, extremely overestimated me. And what I mean by that is he kind of, like, overloved me in this way where he literally thought I could do anything, right? And so I kind of grew up just with this idea of I think I can do anything, right? Even things I definitely, absolutely could not do. And so in eighth grade, this all kind of came crashing down on me in this one specific tryout. And just by a show of hands, I want to know how many of you are just so grateful to be done with your eighth grade year of life? Yes, <laughs> right? Yeah, like eighth grade, right? Just like talking about it is bringing anxiety to some of you, right? Like, it's just a terrible time. Um, nobody peaks in eighth grade, you know? And if you do, like, that's a problem, right? And so um, my eighth grade year, I decide that I'm going to try out for volleyball. And yeah, um, the thing is, is that um, I had never not once played volleyball. Um, I had never been to a volleyball camp. I had never, um, you know, like had any sort of coach in volleyball, never played a game. I didn't know the rules. You know, it was pre-YouTube. I couldn't like look it up, right, of like volleyball 101. And I decided that I'm going to try to play volleyball because not only did I believe that I probably could play any sport, I also started believing this other lie, and that was that I needed to prove myself to my friends to be worthy of them. Right, because they started saying this little thing that was starting to really tick me off. And they were starting to say that they didn't know if Anne was a real athlete. Right, yeah, mm. Yeah, because I was a cheerleader, which is a sport. Which is a sport. That's right. You know, never mind that we like flip our own bodies in the air and throw people into the air with sheer muscle, okay? But um, they didn't think I was a real athlete. And so they were kind of starting to pick on me, you know, and I'm like, okay, whatever, I can play this. I'm going to play volleyball. That's what real athletes do. Cool girls play volleyball. And so the day of the tryout comes, and if you can just imagine, um, you know, it was the late 90s. It was a bad time for women's fashion. And... Um, just a lot of leopard print pants and clogs, like it's just bad. And, but I'm like, okay, like I can be a volleyball player, you know, like I was super girly, but I was like, yeah, I can be a volleyball player, cool. So I like tear off sleeves of a like t-shirt that I thought looked like the coolest, you know, like the most like hardcore. And um, instead of like a big cheerleader ponytail, I was like, I'm going to have like an athlete, like big bun, you know, just like slick back and like super cool. And um, I got some of those shorts that are just so unfortunate. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Just like they're made of spandex. Like who on earth? did that to women, I don't know. But, um, cause I'm like volleyball girls wear spandex, which is just not good, you know? And I'm like, I'm gonna look like the volleyball girl, like I am in it. And so tryouts come and, you know, I'm like in my mind, in my room before the, the night before, like playing Hanson to get all hyped up, which some of you don't know who that is, but like if you can just picture this nervous eighth grader, acne everywhere, like it's just bad. And um, so the tryouts come, I'm terrible, obviously. And, uh, you know, I hit the coach with the ball at one point, and, you know, she's saying things to me like bump, set, spike, and I, I'm like, you know, bump, you know, like, what, and the spike, like, do we act like spikes here, you know, like, I just had no idea. And uh, my friends are all amazing, of course, at the sport, because they'd been playing for a long time. And so, you know, they're like saying things, you're know, like, we knew she wasn't a real athlete, you know. And so the next day, they post the list of who made it, and I was not on the list. I know, thank you for your sympathy. And um, I appreciate that. Um, but the thing is, is that I don't think I actually really wanted to play volleyball. I just had started believing this lie that my worth and value were determined by other people. 
And I know that if you're in this room tonight, you've got your own story, you've got your own things you've believed about yourself, about God, about other people, that may or may not be true. Uh, maybe you believe some things about God, and you've been in here this week, and you're like, I don't know if the God I believe to be true is, is real, or if I've made some, you know, made some conclusions about him that aren't consistent with the Bible, like, I don't know. Like, maybe some of you have grown up in a home where you've believed that God helps those who help themselves, right? And while that looks great on a plaque in a kitchen somewhere, um, it's really depressing, and it's nowhere in the Bible. Or maybe you believe that you've just got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and so does everybody else, and that's also not consistent with the God of the Bible. See, in a room like this, I know that each one of you have walked in here with your own beliefs. And as you've been talking about this idea today of believe, you surely have been thinking about the things that you believe or don't believe. Um, I am getting this experience up close and personal right now in a really fun and exhausting way. Um, I have two kids. Uh, I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old. I'm going to show you a picture. Yes. Yes, they are precious. Um, I'm also very tired, so if you want to bring me a coffee later, I will not say no. Uh, I just like downed like a gallon of Dunkin' Donuts. Um, coffee, not donuts. That'd be, I'd be passed out. Um, but yeah, so I've got two kids, and my five-year-old has a lot of questions about life right now. Um, he is just trying to make sense of the experience around him, right? And so the thing about kids that I love so much and that also just makes me just kind of weary is that um, kids ask their questions right out loud. Like, they are not ashamed of them. They don't feel insecure about them. They aren't thinking to themselves, like, is this dumb? Like, they're just asking it. And so do you guys want to hear some of the questions my son's been asking me lately? Yes. I think someone just shouted no. <laughs> He's so angry already. Um, okay, so here are some of his latest questions. Is who cares a bad word or a good word? It's confusing, right? I don't know. Where do babies come from? Yeah. Um, he asks this about once a week, and every time so far I have left the dinner table and left it up to my husband. Um, why do people get married? Why do we live on the earth? Will we ever live on other planets? Do you think heaven is real or pretend? Is Jesus in heaven? Can I see Jesus? If Jesus is in my heart, why don't I look exactly like him? <laughs> right? It's, yeah, it's confusing, okay? My life is hard. I am weary. Um, do you think people are good or bad? Why do people do bad things? Do only bad people do bad things or do good people do bad things? Yeah, this is just like my daily life. And the thing is, is that sometimes as we get further into adulthood, we stop asking things right out loud. Right? Like, it's not that we stop having questions. It's just that we stop feeling bold enough to just say them or ask them. And I think this is especially true within faith communities and within churches, and you guys know this just as much as I do, because while the church should be the safest place, for us to ask our questions about God, about Jesus, about life, about the Bible out loud, for some reason we start stuffing them, right? And we start believing, if I say this, people won't know how to react or people won't know how to handle this. And so we start believing that we've got to just like stuff all of this stuff and somehow that'll make it better. See, if you're anything like I was in high school, maybe you've spent some of your time the last year avoiding a lot of these questions, right? Like, it's not like you've walked in antagonistic about anything. It's just that you're kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of here to have some fun. And if you guys would just kind of like lighten up on the Jesus stuff, you know, my week would go a lot better, right? And some of you, though, maybe you have had like the best year of your life and you can't even imagine one day where life with Jesus is going to be hard. And some of you in this room are maybe somewhere in the middle of all of that. And it's not so much that you've got a lack of belief in God or Jesus, but that maybe you've spent the last year numbing out. Numbing out with maybe some things that looked fine at first, but you've got some pain in your life or you've got some doubts. And so you've covered them with some things that would take the edge off a little bit or quiet the noise in your mind a little bit, right? 
The thing is, is that when we're distracted and when we're numb, it becomes really, really hard to hear the truth. Do any of you, by a show of hands, have a friend in your life that is like a punch-your-guts truth teller? Yeah? Yeah. You're telling me her name. You can tell me afterwards, I promise. Um, if you aren't raising your hand, this is probably you, you know? Um, and I definitely have that friend. Her name is Maria. And uh, Maria and I met in college, and for 10 years... Maria has been telling me the truth, whether I want to hear it or not. Now, don't get me wrong, like, we definitely have friendship, you know, she's not just like a random stranger telling me things I don't want to hear about myself. We've got some friendship and love and all of that stuff built over time, but she is definitely the kind of person that is going to call me out on some things. In fact, just last month, um, we were having a conversation on the phone, and halfway through the conversation, she's like, Anne, I'm just... I'm so thankful because you have really grown this year and not letting pride dominate your thoughts. I was like, thank you. You know, like, I'm so appreciative. Um, you know, like, she's the kind of friend that if we had been friends in high school, she would have been telling people that their proposal was a terrible idea, you know? Um, she would have told you if your makeup, like, she would have been the real person to be like, you've got lipstick, like, right here, you know? And the thing about her is that she's um, kind and true. Like, she holds both of them together. And it's this thing I don't totally understand. Because I don't know about you, but for me, um, I haven't always held those two things well at the same time. Like, I've either been one or the other. In fact, when I was in college and I was on an internship at a church in North Carolina, um, one, oh, okay, sweet. Um, yeah, I lived there for like a year. Um, but, uh, don't know much about it, honestly. But, um, you know those times when you can tell that someone's going to tell you something, like, hard, and they're, like, showering you with compliments, and you're like, just get to the point, you know? Well, one day my boss is like, hey, Ann, um, I want to talk to you. You know, you, you've been so amazing this year, and I'm like, okay, I know what's coming. Um, and he's like, I want to talk to you about um, how every leader has a toolbox with tools in it, and I know you, you might not use tools, which is true. Like, I wasn't offended. Like, I had no idea how to use a toolbox. And he's like... Um, so, so far, you're only using the hammer in the toolbox, and I want to teach you how to use other tools, you know? So, like, I'm not like a Maria, right? Like, I'm either kind of one or the other sometimes, and you've been in this book of First John all week long, and this is the kind of leader and pastor that John was. Like, he was kind and true. He was gracious and honest. He said some really hard things to the people that he was talking to, and to you and me. And then he also called them brother and used family words to show that he was affectionate toward them, like he loved them. He said things like, if you don't love your brother, you can't love God. And you can't be in darkness and walk in light. And this whole idea here is that when Jesus gets a hold of your life, it changes your heart DNA. Like, it changes every single thing about you. And the thing is about Maria in my life is that she's still calling me out on pride and on sin because apparently I still need to hear it. And with John, as we're going to dive into tonight, he's talking to the church and to us because apparently we still need to hear the words that he's writing to us. And so if you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, we're going to start out in verse 15. We're going to read together, and if you don't have your Bible with you, we'll have it on the screen. He writes, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So he zeroes in here on three things that keep us from belief, and I want to go back to those things. A craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and our possessions. So we're going to talk about the first two first, and then we're going to come back to the third. And the reason why is the first two come from something we don't have that we want, 
Or like he describes them as a craving, as a desire or lust, something that we are wanting. And he's not talking, he's not saying here like the world is bad. Because remember, this is the same author who wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So he's not talking about beauty and nature and things that God created for our good. He's talking about when you let the world start consuming you. When you let things of this life start controlling you, that's the problem. It's when things that God designed for good become distorted and begin dominating your life. That's what he's addressing here. I have an extreme version of this from my own life. See, when I was in high school, when I was your age, I was um, battling um, an eating disorder called bulimia. And for those of you who don't know, it's really um, just this practice of consuming a lot of food, like completely out of control, and then trying to get rid of it in any way possible. And see, the thing is, is it would be easy to believe about people with eating disorders that food is the problem, but it's never the problem. Right? That's just like the outside. The problem is something inside that we're using food to mask. And eventually food starts becoming the thing that controls us. And so maybe you've not had something that extreme, right? But it doesn't have to go to addiction for it to control you. It doesn't have to go to a disorder for it to control you. Pleasure, fun, celebration, food, all of those things God created for our good, but they can become distorted and begin controlling us if we're not paying attention. It's this whole idea of that sin might be fun at first, right? But it's going to take you further than you ever planned on going. And it will leave you emptier than you ever believed you could be. And that's what he's talking about. Over the last couple of years, um, my husband and I have been doing that thing that people do in their 30s. And if you follow anyone on Instagram in their 30s, you've probably seen this. Um, We've been getting healthy. Yeah, it's like super awful. (laughs) Um, Just real boring. And... um, So I'm going to totally sound like a Netflix documentary here, and I'm just, like, going to apologize in advance for how annoying this is going to be. But um, we were like, okay, you know, we're adults now. Like, we've got children. You know, we're, like, raising human beings. We should probably begin to figure out how to eat like normal humans, right? And I've been recovered from my eating disorder for a long time, so it's nothing to do with that. We're just like, we're going to start eating like normal humans. We're going to eat things from the ground, right? We're going to stop eating, like, spray cheese out of a can, you know, you know, the stuff that you're just like, okay, well, you know, it's not going to last, okay? Um, you know, stuff that you're just like, I know this is terrible for me, but, like, it just tastes so good, you know? And we're like, all right, like, let's start becoming healthy, and doctor's visits are changing, and they're like, you know, you got to come back for another checkup. You know, I'm like, what? Like, what is this business? So, um, anyway, so we start getting healthy, and last summer, we decided we are going to stop eating sugar for, like, a month. And so then we went two months and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah, it was terrible. And um, so one day my husband comes home and he's got all these bags of groceries with, like, all the boring stuff, right, like fruits, vegetables, you know, yada, yada. And I'm just, like, seeing sadness in Meyer bags, you know. And um, he puts them on the counter, and I'm like, you know, I've not had sugar in a long time. I'm going to have some strawberries because that's where I'm at now. And so I'm like, all right, I want to have some strawberries. So I cut up the strawberries. And I take a bite, and, like, I totally kind of freaked out, because I was like, what happened to this strawberry? Like, what is going on? Like, Kyle, where did you get these? Like, I don't trust you. Where have you been? Like, what state did these strawberries come from? The strawberry tasted so good to me. It tasted like nothing I'd ever had before. Like, it tasted like dessert. I was like, what is going on? And see, the thing is, is that nothing changed about the strawberries at all. They were from the same mire, which is a delightful place. There's no shame on mire, but um, they were from the same place. It's just that everything had changed about my appetite. And sin is very, very similar to this. See, the strawberries tasted like dessert to me, and the same is true with the good things that God has given us. The hard part about sin is that it's deceitful. Right? And it can trick us into believing that this is good for us, but we know it's not good. It can be masked by something that might not look all that bad at first, but over time it leads to death. Right? Things like greed, love of money, pornography, comparing ourselves to other people, gossip, lying. 
over time, God started to rewire our appetites and how we thought about food, and he started bringing me to this beautiful truth about himself. See, I think when I first became a Christian, I thought that I had to follow all of these rules and that, like, maybe God didn't want me to have fun, you know? But what I, what I discovered was that God does not want to starve us. He wants to nourish us. He loves us. He's created these good things for our good, but not to control us. And so the third thing that John talks about is pride. Pride in our achievements and in our possessions. And it doesn't come from a need that we have, but something that we've already, like, acquired. Right? And the, the thing about pride is that it can be so, so sneaky because you might not even know that it's existing in you unless someone is really up close in your business and can call it out. It can mask itself in so many things, an achievement and accomplishment, and those things aren't bad. Like, God has designed us to work. It's when the work starts controlling us or our identity becomes in those things and consuming us and our, our value, our purpose becomes about the things that we can do or about the money that we can have that makes us feel secure. And the thing that's so dangerous about pride, specifically when it comes to achievements and possessions, is it leads us to believe that we are fine on our own, that we don't need God, that we don't need other people, and our hearts begin to become so, so hard. And before we know it, we are so far away from who God has created us to be. See, for me, pride has made me become not desperate for God. Right? Like, when I know that I'm weak, I need him. But in my pride, I start thinking, like, I've got this all together. And that is the thing that John's writing about that can keep us from belief. What I find so interesting is that all three of these things that John talks about were also at play in the garden. See, in Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent is talking to Eve, he asks her this question. In Genesis 3 verse 1, he says, Did God really say that you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say? And Eve, it's so interesting, she responds back to the serpent with God's truth. She responds to him like, yes, yes, he did. He told them, he told us not to. And then the enemy tells her, the serpent tells her like, just go ahead. Like, you're not going to die. Just go ahead. Not only can you eat it, you can be like God. He was wooing her with pride and power. And she saw that it was beautiful. And it looked delicious. And she wanted to have power and be like God. And so she ate it all because of this little lie. Did God really say? See, while we think maybe it starts with craving or that it would start with pride, it begins with belief. What do you believe about God? Is his voice even present in your life? Because if you don't know what God has said, if you've never gotten to know him through his word on your own and with other people, you're never going to know the difference when you're being fed lies. If you don't know what God says about you, what God says about himself, you'll believe the lies of the enemy, of our world, of your friends, of whoever you're following on social media. And you'll begin to ask, ask yourself, or you'll be posed with the question, did God really say Did God really say that Jesus is the only way? Did God really say that hell is a real place? Did God really say that marriage is designed to be between one man and one woman? Did God really say? Recently, I was in a conversation with a family friend of ours, and um, he has been close with us for a long time, and he's not a Christian, and he's one of those guys that um, he does say his questions right out loud, which I actually love, and um, we have him over for dinner, and um, we're just super close with him, and we invite him to church, and he usually says no, you know, he's like, no, and, um, but sometimes on holidays, he'll, like, entertain us with a yes, and I think deep down, he's maybe coming 
for like the social experiment, you know, in his mind. He's like, I'm going to see what these Christians are like, you know, like he thinks of us as these just like weirdos, you know. And so this, um, a couple years ago, he came um, on Christmas and he walked into our worship center and I'll never forget, I'm not going to tell you the entire phrase because it was inappropriate, but um, he looked over at me and he's like, where are all these people from, you know? He's like, are all these, do these people all believe in God? Like, I thought there were two of you, you know? And, um, you know, and I'm like, yes, you know, well, not all of them, but some of them, you know, and he's like, I didn't even know there were this many Christians in America. Like, he was just so confused. And that's just kind of the person that he is. And so one night, he's over for dinner at our house, and we're going back and forth about questions about God and Jesus and the Bible and what any of this has to do with real life. And he starts um, not just asking us questions, but kind of like making fun of us. Right, like kind of making fun of us, like how weird this all really is. Um, like you seriously believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You're like, you seriously believe that this guy died on a cross and rose from the grave. Like you actually believe that happened. Like, and he was kind of like mocking us. And honestly, like in my own just like impatience, um, I was starting to get kind of frustrated, you know, because like we love this person. And so finally, like, I just kind of stopped the conversation, and I was like, look, like, you know me. Like, you know us. You know we're not stupid. You know we're not idiots. Like, what is the deal with how you're talking to us right now? And he said this thing that I've never forgotten, and he says, yeah, I know. But the thing is, is that if you really believe this, like, for real, you believe this, you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, and that has something to do with how you live your life now, that changes everything. And he's not wrong. And I think for a lot of us, maybe that's the reason why we try not to engage with this too closely is because we're afraid of how this news of Jesus is going to change us and how it will change the things that we know or the things that we hold tightly to. And so I want to go to First John Chapter 2, down to verses 24 through 25, where John sums this up. And he says, So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. See, here's the hardest part about belief. It doesn't just happen one time. It's not just a one-time event. It's remaining faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. And for some of you in this room, the beginning was last night. And so you're like, well, that's not hard. That's been like 24 hours, right? But for some of you in this room, the beginning was 10 years ago or five years ago. And you've discovered that remaining faithful is hard. And see, the thing is, is that you're not going to wake up tomorrow with a lifetime of faith sewn into who you are. It comes from discipline. It comes from things you cannot Instagram. It comes from spending time in God's word, spending time with other people who believe in him, serving, being in a small group, telling people right out loud your doubts, your questions, your biggest fears, your sin, confession. Because the thing is, is while your relationship with God is personal, It should never, ever be private. And there's a big difference. Because through scripture and through all of our lives, when we come to faith in Christ, it's never private. It's personal, yes. But it's not just us on our own. To fight for your faith, you will have to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And then stay close to him every single day. And here's why this is even more important for people like you and me. Because unless any of you are completely crazy and think you've been alive for 2,000 years, none of us in this room have seen Jesus face to face, right? We've not seen him. We've not felt his embrace. We've not touched his hand or felt him hug us. I didn't see him with my own eyes rise from the dead, And John, who's writing this, was so close to Jesus. He was one of his closest friends. He would have been the person who took care of Jesus' mother after he died. And so for him, he's writing something that he's seen, and he's writing to people who are believing what they've never seen. 
And he's telling us, you're going to have to fight for your faith, and you've never seen this. See, what I didn't tell you about that volleyball tryout was that it was one of the hardest years of my life. And I know eighth grade is terrible just because it's eighth grade, but um, it was also the year that so much chaos was happening in my life and in my family. See, a few years before that, my parents had gotten divorced. And I know that so many of you in this room have experienced this, right? It's like the pain of divorce is so common, no one even cares, right? But it feels like death. And so um, there was a lot of fallout in our home for years because of this and because of some choices that some adults had made that were super painful and really, really hard. And so I wanted to be important and I wanted to be noticed and I wanted to be known. And so I was trying to be all these different things and not just because I wanted to play volleyball, but because I wanted to matter. And I wanted to forget about some of the things that had happened to me that year that had really confused me. See, the thing is, is um, what happened that year is that I became a Christian, and it was all new to me. Like, I didn't grow up knowing all of this, and so there was so much that was brand new. And so while that year Jesus saved my soul, over time it was the Word of God that renewed my mind. Because over, the, over time, there had been some things I had started to believe about God and about myself that were not true, and I had to get to know him in his word to find out. Some things I believed about sexuality that weren't true and weren't good for me. Some things I believed about myself that weren't true and weren't good for me. Some things I believed about men that weren't true and weren't good for me. Some things I believed about other people that weren't true and weren't true of God at all. Being rooted and grounded in God's word, having an ongoing commitment to a local church and other people, those are the things over time that helped me to believe every day. See, when I was this nervous little eighth grader, leopard print pants, Hanson, just all the mess, right? Um, this youth leader came into my life and some of you guys have had this experience where you're like assigned a small group leader, right? And it kind of wasn't the person you were hoping. You know, none of you are going to admit it, and that's okay. But um, it's okay. It's okay. We all, we all sin, fall short. And um, so her name was Pam, and um, she was my small group leader my freshman year. And I kind of didn't really know who she was, and I was kind of like, uh, you know, I didn't really like her at first, right? Because she was always telling me the truth. Like, she was just always, like, going for it. And I was like, okay, lady, like, back up, you know? Like, you don't know my life. And she'd pick me up from high school sometimes. We'd go out to coffee, and she'd want to know about my boyfriend. I'm like, I'm sorry, who are you, you know? Um, and I was just a brat. Like, honestly, I was such a disaster. Um, so for those of you in the room who are youth leaders and hanging with the disasters, just, like, keep hanging, you know? Not that any of you are. You're all precious angels. But... Um, <laughs> but I was a disaster. And so this woman, like, just stuck with me. And so she would pick me up from school. She'd pick me up to take me to church. Um, she started teaching me the Bible, even when I didn't like it, even when I would deny it. And so when I was in college, I want to show you a picture of Pam. Um, this was us a few years ago. Um, but several years ago when I was in college, we met back up um, when I lived in North Carolina, actually, and I said, hey, can we just start meeting up once a month, and I would love for you to mentor me and just um, help just, like, pour into me, because I really need an older woman in my life, and some maturity had happened, right, and so I wasn't, like, so annoying, so I'm sure it didn't, like, terrify her that I wanted to hang out, and um, so we started getting coffee once a month, and she started asking me the hard questions, and she really was the first person to teach me how to read the Bible for myself and to challenge me to stay committed to a local church, to be a part of everything, not just attend and consume. And she would continually push me back to the truth of God's word. And I tell you about her, because almost two years ago, one day, she suddenly lost her husband in a terrible bicycle accident. And she went from being the most grateful wife that anyone knew to a widow with three small children in a city with no family. 
And the thing is, is that um, I've watched up close over the last two years this woman that I've known for almost two decades believe every day. And it's astounded me. Right? Like, she's not without grief, but she's not in despair. Her belief in Jesus that he is who he said he was, that he can restore all things, gives her hope and grief that does not make any sense. She isn't skipping around pretending like none of this hurts because it hurts. It's horrible and it was unjust and terrible, but she believes that God will redeem it and he will be faithful to her and he will provide for her in ways that she cannot imagine. And see, the thing is, is that Pam could have said, God, I am done. Like, I am done with you. I've served you my whole life. I've loved you, and this is how you repay me. She could have said, I don't believe in you anymore. Like, how could you let this happen to me? She could have denied his existence, believed that a good God could never allow this, or numbed herself with addiction or anything to take the edge off. But instead, what I've seen is this woman be deeply rooted and the God she's known for decades. And the Bible that she's been reading every day has become so real and tangible to her. And see, we can't picture it now, but all of us at some point are going to have a dark night. And what comes up out of us is what we begin here. What you begin here, the belief every day, is what comes out of you in the hardest of times, in the most big of temptations. What truth you listen to, the voice that is the loudest is what comes out of you, and that starts here. See, when you're rooted in God's word, you can battle against the lies of the enemy. Believing God every day means letting his voice be the loudest in your life. The biggest thing killing our churches right now, I am so convinced, is not persecution, because if you've ever studied church history, you know that the church flourishes under persecution. But it's this belief that we can just sleep our way through this life, that we don't have to battle for this, that we can just press pause and just kind of like chill. But belief is a battle. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible tells us, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy. The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, if we do not know the truth of God's word, we will never know the difference when we are being fed a lie. When our minds and hearts become baked in this truth, we begin to transform. Our pain transforms. Our sin transforms. Things become redeemed that we never believe could have been, and that has been absolutely true in my life. If you would have told me when I was sitting in a room just like this at 16 that God would heal me from the things I was struggling with, I never would have believed you. But belief every day has caused me to look back and say, God, you are so faithful. You are so good. See, when his voice becomes the loudest in our lives, other lies begin to shrink away. And when you know God's word, this is what starts to happen. Because when we think our value comes from what other people think of us, we will remember through his word that God says that we are unconditionally loved and valued beyond what we can ever imagine. When we're tempted to let the words of shame cover us and be spoken over us, we will remember that God's voice is louder than any shame and we can bring anything out into the light. When we're tempted to think that what's been done to us will destroy us or what we've done will destroy us, we will remember that on the cross, Jesus destroyed everything that you think is destroying you. When we're tempted to think that we've messed up, that we've gone too far, we will remember that this message of grace isn't for everyone but you and me. When we're tempted to think that a little porn won't hurt, we'll remember that giving into the craving of our eyes will ultimately destroy our souls and the relationships we have both now and in the future. When we're tempted to think that we're really alone, we will remember that Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit and we do not have to be alone for one day. When we're tempted to think that we're not as blank as whatever or whoever we're following on social media, we'll remember that if we stare into our screens more than we read his word, we will not know his truth about us and about him. 
When we're tempted to think that we can't tell anyone about our thoughts of depression or suicide, we will remember that God knows every single thing about us, that he numbered the hairs on our head, and we can bring anything out into the light, that he can take it. When we're tempted to think that our broken hearts could swallow us whole, we'll believe that God is close to the brokenhearted, and we'll remember that he saves those whose spirits are completely crushed. So I want to leave you with three questions tonight. What do you believe about Jesus? Do you believe that he's good? And is his voice the loudest in your life? And for those of you that are saying like, well, I don't, I've never heard God's voice. Um, it's in here. You do not have to sit in a corner and hum somewhere. You can get to know him through his word and through other people who love him too. Your answer to these questions will change everything. Because when God's voice becomes the loudest in your life, you know that nothing can ever really be taken from you because Jesus can never be taken from you. You could tell him every doubt, every pain, every fear, every temptation, every longing, every craving, because guess what? He knows it anyway. When God's voice is the loudest in your life and you commit to believing him in him every day, you don't have to manage an image for anyone because Jesus is the only one that you answer to. See, having an unshakable faith is not a life without pain, without doubt, without trial, but choosing to believe in Jesus every day, no matter what. So this morning, you guys wrote out some words that have kept you from belief. And maybe for you, that's been a pain that you've experienced or a question that you've had or something that someone has said to you or that you've believed about yourself. And I took some time tonight to walk over and read them. And man, guys, I just, my heart broke for you because I remember. I remember those things that I believed about myself and about other people and about God that did not come from his word at all. And I didn't know how to battle yet, but I want to tell you there is so much hope. There is so much hope because of what Jesus did on the cross and this ability that we have to come to him every day brand new and say, God, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And so tonight, over the next few songs, we're going to have the opportunity to practice what it looks like to believe in community. Because while faith is personal and Jesus, our relationship with him is personal, it should never be private. And so what I want you to do tonight <clears throat> over the next couple of songs is to just walk up to one of those boards and they're over on this side and over here. And you'll see a word that someone in this room, another brother or sister in Christ, wrote. And I want you to take it off, and it'll peel off, and then put it on your shirt or on your pant leg. Just nothing weird, okay? You guys know. And for the next 24 hours, I want you to wear it. And as you feel it, or as you think about it, or as you see it, to pray for the person who wrote that. And you can pick something that you resonate with, or that you identify with, or that you've thought to, but don't pick your own. Because as you pray for that person, you're practicing what it looks like to bear one another's burdens, to believe alongside others, to pray for people that are struggling with doubt. Because guys, we don't have to face doubt alone. God never said that. We can bring those things to him and to each other and believe for each other when doubt is too loud and ask God for help and our unbelief. So I want to pray for you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that we are good because of you. You are good. That we cannot bring anything to you, but God, you did everything for us on the cross. While we were helpless, you died for us. God, I ask tonight in these next few songs, Lord, that you would heal some wounds tonight. That you would be so present 
in the midst of some sincere doubt tonight. That you would help us take one step toward you. That we don't have to have it all figure out, figured out today. But we can take one step of belief and say, God, I trust you. I trust that I don't know everything. I trust that I need you. And Lord, thank you for the gift of your church. God, that we can walk in our doubt alongside other people, that we don't have to be alone ever. God, I pray tonight can just be a tangible expression of what it looks like to believe every day, both in you and then alongside other people. In Jesus' name, amen.